Last year, we were coming out of the final concert at the Montreat Worship and Music Conference. And as I was exiting Anderson Auditorium there in Montreat, I was approached by a woman named Joan Murkison. When I was a student at Columbia Seminary, Joan's husband, Cam, was our vice president and academic dean. Joan, his wife, worked as a writing coach and she was the main uh, collaborator for a major lectionary-based commentary that the seminary was producing at the time. Uh, after I graduated in 2011, uh, Joan invited me to write a series of essays for that commentary series on the Gospel of Luke. And so I ran into Joan again as we were leaving Anderson Auditorium, and she told me that she had been uh, pulled in yet again for another lectionary-based commentary series called Connections that was being made possible by Austin Seminary. And she said, are you interested in writing again? I've got uh, openings available if you're interested. And I was uh, delighted to have the chance that I had passed the test from years ago, and my ego soared. I feigned humility in accepting the assignment, imagining how my words would reach preachers around the country trying to hone their homiletical skills. I would find myself footnoted in countless sermon manuscripts across the nation. You know how powerful ego is, right? So a few weeks later, I got an email with my assignment, and it said in the body of the email, you have passages, listen to this, for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then back to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Fourth Sunday of Advent, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Those are important days in the life of the church. I was going to be crafting words that would be utilized to help illustrate the doctrine of the incarnation. And so I opened the PDF that accompanied the email that had which passages I was going to be writing. Now, you need to know, we have a lot of Episcopalians here today, so that's helpful because they know about lectionaries. Um, so the, the lectionary is a series of four readings for every Sunday of the year. There's an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a reading from one of the Gospels, and an epistle. That's one of the letters of Paul. And so my assignment for the fourth Sunday of Advent, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, was not the annunciation of Christ's birth to Mary by the angel Gabriel. It was not the birth story of Jesus being laid in the manger. It was not that beautiful poem of incarnation and creation in John chapter 1. No. I was assigned the epistle readings for those three days. And those readings are from the letter to Titus. Who here has ever heard a sermon on Christmas Eve from the letter to Titus? Right. I don't think I'd ever spend any time exploring that letter, and I've never heard anyone preach a sermon on Titus, especially during Advent. The good news of this story is that my ego immediately returns to an appropriate size, and I was able to repent of my vanity. It's hard to imagine that these essays are submitted now, that anyone will ever read them to prepare a fourth Sunday of Advent or Christmas Eve meditation. Wise preachers will stick to Luke 2 and the manger story. <laughs> but we're in the year of the Bible, and so we have a chance to hear from the letter to Titus. And so, at least for one 15-minute session, someone is going to benefit from the work that I put into these essays. So for the Connections Commentary Series, this is Titus 3, 4 to 7. There's a new definition in our popular culture in recent years for the word washed. Whereas the older definition dealt primarily with cleanliness, the new definition is describing a stage of life that a person comes to. There's a writer for GQ, Zach Barron, who talked about this. He defines washed by saying, it's not quite washed up with its connotations of lounge singers in Vegas reflecting on their glory days. It's more about that transitive moment. There you are in the train station of life, waving goodbye to your edge and your youth as they depart. 
Think of the starting quarterback who's moving towards the end of his career. His glory days are behind him, but he's not quite ready yet to give up the starting spot and ride the bench. It's the singer who still sells out the largest stadiums when she's on tour, but she's not producing top hit albums anymore. It's the executive who's climbed the ladder but knows that no more promotions are coming. Barron explains that the way of describing this stage of life as being washed is usually used as a pejorative term, a negative term. Yet in his article, Barron defends the way of being washed as living in a way of contentment, of happiness, of self-acceptance. He uses the tennis great Roger Federer and his defeat in the 2011 U.S. Open as an example of when someone modeled the positive version of being washed. As at this point in his career, Federer had lost some of his dominance in tennis. What he displayed after the loss, however, was revelatory for his career. Federer did not stop playing tennis because he lost this match and was no longer the pinnacle of all tennis players. Barron writes, He let go of the idea of himself as perfection incarnate. He let go of the idea of himself in some ways entirely. After a decade of representing some abstractly infallible version of whatever it is he was trying to be, a pursuit that seemed to make him miserable, especially when he was young, he was just a man with a bad back and some talent that he was still trying to make the best of. He stopped crying so much in post-match interviews. He raised one set of twins and then another. These days he takes the spring off in order to rest for the summer. Washed. Perhaps this new definition of washed not so new at all. As Christians, we have been affirming this way of living as washed for millennia around fonts and baptistries and on riverbanks. To be washed is to understand that we are not valuable because of what we achieve. We are not lovable because of how creative, successful, unique, brilliant, powerful, or beautiful we are. We are not bound to a life that demands that we be someone better than someone else by comparison at all times. To be washed is to be accepted by God's grace. We are washed as Titus is reminded, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to God's mercy. Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth says it this way, Predestined man is he who in and with God's choice is not met with honor and approval, but by justification, by grace alone, by forgiveness. Who is not the object of divine election in virtue of a life which is acceptable and welcome to God, but because God covers, transforms, and renews his unworthy and rebellious life. Whom the sovereign God encounters, not with a natural therefore, but with a miraculous nevertheless. So the scenario is not, Andrew has done remarkable things for God, therefore he is saved. It is instead, even though Andrew is driven by ego that wants accolades for writing a commentary and his desire to be acknowledged frequently drives him to treat other people in ways that violate the truth that they are made in God's image, nevertheless, he has been saved. He has received mercy. He has been washed. To be washed 
is to accept God's grace lavished over us in Jesus Christ, in the waters of our baptism, and to welcome the coming of the Holy Spirit, which enables righteous living. To be washed is to give up the competition to prove ourselves better than others and instead to live solely for the joy and the delight of God's goodness. We do this not because we need to compensate God because God has been gracious, but in gratitude for a grace that comes to claim us before we can even know it. Being washed then is this willingness to accept who we are in God. Being washed, though, also means that we acknowledge there's something in us that needs to be cleansed. Something needs to be purified. There's something not right that we can't repair or purge. Submitting to that cleansing then takes an acknowledgement that we are not enough by ourselves or by seeking to live by our own priorities. Now, in some Christian traditions, because of this need for washing, the act of baptism occurs only after somebody can repent of his or her sin and acknowledge their need for cleansing. In our tradition, we baptize adults who come to that place, but we also baptize infants. David Burtis is going to be baptized in a few minutes. David cannot repent of his sin. David cannot relinquish the need so many of us have to prove our worthiness to others. David can't even accept that he's been accepted by God. He's just going to be held by his parents, passed to the preacher, and paraded down the aisle. The letter to Titus tells us, though, that this act of pure gift... This free reception God grants us, that's how God works. He saved us according to His mercy, we read. God is the actor here. We are the recipient. Mercy is free. Not even our initial repentance is required. Now, the hope for David is the hope for us all. Somewhere along the line, we do come to acknowledge our proclivity to live separate from God's goodness and grace. We recognize our sin, grow weary in our obsession with our performance and our reputation and the ego boosts that we need. And in those moments, we come to marvel that we have been saved by God's free grace. That that grace saved us before we even knew how much we needed it. God's embrace surrounded us while we were still fighting, tugging, pulling away from God. God's mercy has enveloped us with no requirements, with no contingencies. To be washed then is to welcome ourselves and accept God's love that is for us freely. Our need to be the best to receive the most praise can't save us. And the sin that pours forth from our pride and selfishness can't separate us. We are God's great nevertheless. Let us therefore live for God all our days. Amen.